Hello, and welcome to the Radiant Mission Podcast. My name is Rebecca Toomey, and we are on a mission to encourage and inspire you as you're navigating through your life and with your relationship with Christ. For the past nine episodes, we have been in a series called God's Design for Women's Health. And today we are bringing that series to a close for now. (laughs) I'm sure there's going to be lots more we have to talk about on this topic, but for now we are wrapping health because we are going to be moving in to a very cool series where we're sharing folks' testimonies and you're not going to want to miss that. So be sure to stay tuned with us on that. So for this last episode in this series on women's health, I'm going to address something that I've actually been requested to address in addition to really wanting to address this from so many different women in the birth communities that I'm in asking about Rogam and if Rogam is okay or healthy or should a woman take it or should they not. And I know that you might feel like this topic belongs in our series on birth and it does to some extent, but this goes a lot deeper than just Rogam, you guys. Rogam is one singular product, one singular blood product. There are lots of different blood products. So this idea of being injected with the blood of others or blood products or the use of blood products, that is really part of the larger focus of this episode. So I'm going to be sharing my personal story along with some information and just thoughts about our bodies and blood in general. And, you know, just as we've discussed those predatory marketing tactics, the same thing and those same tactics are aimed at women when it comes to our blood as well. Our blood is a target and that is my personal opinion. So before we get started into any of this, I'm going to go ahead and give my disclaimer. This is not medical advice. This episode is my own personal story in conjunction with my own personal opinion (laughs) and a biblical approach to this topic as well. And that is the topic of blood. So if you don't want to hear about blood, probably not the episode for you, but if you're interested in protecting your blood and you're interested in understanding why your blood is important and why you should preserve it and be cautious about what you have injected, then stay tuned. And you also might be interested to hear what happened to me in my experience because there are a lot of other products out there, like I said, besides Rogam that can cause the issues that happened to me. So let's kick this off with why is blood important? And it all starts very early on in the Bible, but I want to point specifically to Leviticus 1711. We are told for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Our blood is our life force, according to the Bible. And that makes sense, right? Because if we didn't have any blood in our bodies, we would not be alive. (laughs) We would not be here. (laughs) I wouldn't be talking to you right now if I didn't have any blood left in my body, right? That is where the life that is inside of, inside of us, that is the force behind our life. Okay. In Genesis nine, verse four, we are told, but you shall not eat flesh with its life. That is its blood an interesting clarification there. Then again, in Leviticus 17, 14, for the life of every creature is in its blood. 
Its blood is its life. This is reiterated. What did I read before? 17 verse 11. This continues to be re reiterated in Leviticus. Definitely recommend go read that whole chapter, chapter 17. But let me go back to this verse. For the life of every creature is its blood. Its blood is its life. Therefore, I have said to the people of Israel, you shall not eat the blood of any creature. For the life of every creature is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. So let's think for a second. A lot of us are meat eaters here. We are told in the Bible that we are to eat the flesh of animals. But something very important to note, you may not know this, but when livestock is slaughtered, the blood is drained from their bodies prior to the butchering process. I know that it may often look like a steak is bloody, but the blood has actually been drained from that meat. And typically there may be something a little bit residual in that muscle mass there, but it is mostly water. So just something of note that may be of interest to you. And there are at least 393 passages in the Bible that mention blood. And of course, you may not be surprised to hear that many of these references are in reference to Christ's blood sacrifice for us or blood as a sacrifice. So again, I mentioned as a preface before I got started that this message, it goes a lot deeper than just Rogan and blood type, but I am going to talk about that a little, a little bit because I think it may be interesting. So let's get into it. And a reminder for the second time, <laughs> this is not medical advice. However, I will be citing from different websites like Johnson and Johnson and the Rogam website and some OBGYN websites and some other medical sources. And I'll link those in the show notes so you can go check this out for yourself. Highly recommend do your own research on this topic and don't take everything that you see at face value, right? Because we know that when we Google things, it's going to give us the most commonly agreed upon answer. It doesn't mean it's the right answer. And then there are interesting little small things that I find fascinating when statistics are shared. I've noticed that when a statistic is really low, that the medical system likes to say things like, oh, three in a hundred thousand, which seems like, oh, three. Wow. Like, yeah, it could be me. But when you take that number and convert it to a percentage, do you know what that is? Three people out of a hundred thousand is 0.003%. It's not very common, right? So we're going to get into a little bit of detail on that. And I'll be really honest with you guys. I had not thought much about my blood my whole life until I had this experience with Rogam. And it was a negative experience that um, really affected me and my health. And I've had blood drawn over the years as young as, you know, childhood, being a teenager. I remember having blood drawn at the doctor when I went to the OBGYN when I was a teenager. Um, I even donated blood when I was younger. When I was in college, my first couple of years, I remember donating blood. But the idea that the blood of an unborn child could then cause me to create antibodies that would then attack a future child growing inside me. Definitely never thought about that until the medical system pushed this narrative on me when I was pregnant with my first baby. And I say the medical system pushed this narrative because I have come to the opinion that this is literally a narrative pushed on mothers because this is another cash grab from the medical system. It's another thing that they can inject women with to add another item onto the bill to charge you for. And I'm sure that there are much more nefarious things going on in the background when it comes to polluting our blood. Our life is in the blood. God gave us our blood. It's important. And so why would, why would we be injecting the vast majority of women with something that could potentially cause an issue in 
of babies. Seems fishy to me, but it only seems fishy to me after going through this experience. So let's keep talking about this and I'll share a couple more details. So what I'm talking about has to do with blood types. The medical system considers RH negative blood or Reese's negative blood, which is what I have, as incompatible with positive blood types when a baby is made. So let's talk a little bit about RH negative blood and what blood type is. According to the American College of Nurse Midwives, your blood type tells you about the markers on the surface of your red blood cells. The red cells in your blood can be A, B, AB, or O. The red blood cells also have a protein that is called RH on the surface of the cell. Your blood can be RH positive, which means that you have the RH protein or RH negative, which means that you do not have the RH protein. The letter of your blood group plus the RH makes your blood type. You can be O positive, O negative, A positive, A negative, B positive, B negative, AB positive, or AB negative. A test that tells you your blood type is done at your first prenatal visit, and usually when you were admitted to the hospital for labor if you're planning a hospital birth. I don't know about that. They never tested my blood when I had my first at the hospital, but maybe they do for some people. Why is blood type important in the medical model? Well, if you need a blood transfusion, you should be given the same blood type that you have. <laughs> so you can become very sick if you are given blood type that is not your own, unless it is O blood type. O is a universal blood type that can be given to others. So interesting there. So what does this mean for pregnancy? Let's talk a little bit about this. And now again, this is according to the medical model that being RH negative, it means that you don't have RH proteins on your red blood cells. And if your baby is RH positive, according to them, and you get a small amount of your baby's blood into your circulation bloodstream when you're pregnant or when you give birth, that your body can then make antibodies that hurt and kill red blood cells that are RH positive. So the theory behind this is that if you have an injury in your womb where your baby is growing that causes your baby's blood to enter your bloodstream, then your body could build antibodies against positive blood type. And in future pregnancies, if you get pregnant with a baby that has a positive blood type, your body could then attack that baby in the womb. And if that were to happen, that is called hematolic disease of the fetus and newborn or HDFN is the name of this disorder. And it is extremely uncommon, extremely uncommon. As I mentioned, and I will give you a stat from Johnson and Johnson's website, three to eight out of every 100,000 births will experience this. How many is that? 0 0.003 to 0.008%. That is less than 1% of live births where this can occur. And let me be clear. People that get the Rogam injection can still become sensitized. So that's what it's called when your negative blood type builds a defense system against positive blood. It is called sensitization. Okay. Well, the medical system, because this happened, created, decided to create an injection to attempt to assist in this quote problem. Okay. 
And how did they decide to do this? Well, I'm going to read you a little, little history here from dallasobgynpa.com. And this article is about the triumph medical science over RH disease. How, how did they solve for this? They created a product from pooled blood that they then injected in a group of male prisoners at Sing Sing prison with RH antibodies. And then they exposed them to the RH protein. The experiment overwhelmingly showed that permanent antibody formation could be prevented by giving temporary antibodies, which today is called Rogam. These antibodies eliminated the immune response. These antibodies in injectable form were marked, marketed as Rogam and approved by the FDA in 1968. Yes, after this study, on male prisoners, they then approved this for use in pregnant women. Time Magazine hailed it as one of the top 10 medical achievements of the 1960s. And today, Rogam is routinely given in the early third trimester of pregnancy and at delivery if the baby is RH positive to RH negative women. Hematolic disease of the newborn which formerly claimed the lives of 10,000 babies each year in the United States has now been virtually eliminated in the developed world. It's tale as old as time. Have you heard this one before? So they are claiming that, that this is the savior to this quote problem. That isn't really that big of a problem. And now what is Rogam? Well, Rogam is the brand name. It's also called Anti-D. It is an immunoglobulin derived from pooled human blood that is given via intramuscular injection and can help prevent isoimmunization from occurring with a blood mixing event. When it works correctly, the Anti-D antibodies fight off the rhesus positive cells from the baby before the mom's body notices them, which prevents the process, process of isoimmunization. The quote, active ingredients, so to speak, are antibodies to rhesus D. According to the makers of Rogam, it is, quote, a sterile solution that complain, contains antibodies to the RH factor. The antibodies are derived from human plasma. Something I would like to make very clear here, there's no filtration ability when it comes to taking this pooled blood that they then inject in you. So if there are underlying diseases or other issues with the blood donation that they have taken from this plasma, that is now injected into your body. It's pretty scary, honestly, when you really think about what is happening. And the potential to create even more health issues from taking someone else's blood and injecting it into your body. Now you might be saying, well, who cares? Like I've gotten blood transfusions and I've gotten other blood products. That's exactly why I'm talking about this. Maybe we should be thinking about this. Maybe we should be more aware and more cautious about the blood that we have put inside of our bodies. And I'm not saying this from a place of judgment, you should know that because I took Rogam in my first pregnancy. I also had a blood transfusion in my first pregnancy after birth, after I lost tons of blood during this ridiculous C-section that I had. So I have received this outside blood. I have received the blood of others into my body. So please do not take this as judgment, but it has woken me up to say, is this what I want to keep doing? Do I keep want to keep taking blood from others into my lifeblood that God gave me? It's a question that I have now been forced to ask myself because of this experience. So what's my story and why should you care? 
when I was pregnant with my first, our daughter, I was told as I was going to these OBs, oh, you have negative blood type. Your husband has positive blood type. Now, listen, uh, they don't care actually if the father is positive. And that is what has led me to feel very negatively about this injection. Because all that matters to the medical model is that the mother has negative blood type. They will try to inject you with this, regardless of if the father is positive or negative. Now, it doesn't. this doesn't mean every OB is going to try to do this, but from the women that I've spoken to, many have had different experiences. And actually, Rachel had an experience where... So, she fortunately didn't have, uh, she wasn't up against this because her husband's blood type was negative, but her, one of her former doctors basically said, well, we can't take your word for it. We don't know who the father is. And that is an assumption made by many OBGYNs is, well, we don't really know who the dad is. He could be positive. Your blood type is negative. So let's just give you this just to be safe. But is it safe? Is it safe to give yourself a blood injection of pooled blood that could potentially have diseases in it just because the dad might be positive and you might get this disorder in a future pregnancy uh, at a rate of 0.003%. It's a question to be had. So I was told I needed to get Rogam and I couldn't find enough research at the time to say no necessarily at that time i was on a mission to understand the childhood vaccine schedule because that was a big priority to me some folks around me who had had children that had very negative experiences said you need to be researching this and so that was what i was mainly focused on so when it came to my 28 week visit cuz that's when they give rogam to women at 28 weeks and then the day that the birth happens after the birth. So interesting, right? Like they say it's because that's when you have the highest chance of a blood mixing event. And what is a blood mixing event? Like you get into a car accident, you fall down the stairs. Uh, that's pretty much it. You get into a serious accident. So first of all, what are the chances of getting into a serious accident? What are the statistics on that? And then if you do, what is the chances that a blood mixing event will happen? Just interesting little things to think about as you consider a product like this. So 28 week appointment, I got it. I got the Rogam injection, like I was told to do. And shortly thereafter, I began to have some pretty serious health problems. But at the time, I didn't know it was from Rogam. Because I was never given information on the side effects of Rogam. I was told I was going to get the injection, given the injection, and that was that. Acted like it's just so normal. Everybody does it. Everybody gets Rogam when they're pregnant, if you're negative blood type. So I get the shot. And within days, I began developing itchy hives all over my entire body in different patches on my arms, on my stomach, on my legs, on my face, on my chest, all over my body. I was breaking out in itchy hives. They were so horribly itchy that I just wanted to rip my skin off. And I didn't know what was happening to me because I didn't connect it to that injection because it didn't happen five minutes after the shot. It happened a couple of days later because it took time for my body to start reacting to what had been injected into it. it doesn't happen overnight, you guys. This is why long-term studies and studying things over days, weeks, months, and years is important. You can't just give somebody a shot and if they don't react in an hour, say everything is fine. That's not a great way to do things. So I bring this issue to my OB because I was miserable and I took the oatmeal baths. I took Benadryl 
I took Claritin and nothing helped me. Nothing was helping. And I went to the OB. I told her what was going on at this point, you know, we're starting to get closer with your appointments. And she was like, I don't know. I thought I was doing research and I thought maybe I had PUPS, P-U-P-P-S, which is an issue that can happen in some women because of the liver bile being off during pregnancy. Did a little bit of research because I was Googling, like, why am I so itchy? Pregnancy, itching during pregnancy. And this is what kept coming up. Issues related to that. So my OB says, just take an oatmeal bath or put some cream on it. And I'm like, lady, I have already tried that. Something is seriously wrong here. Something is wrong. But I knew she wasn't going to help me. Just, you know, I could tell by the way that she communicated. She didn't understand. And I needed to be the advocate for myself and do my own research. So I kept researching. And of course, I thought that it was my liver bile. So I came across an ebook. I think it cost like $4.99 or something. I gladly paid it. It was something about healing your body from pups. And her remedy was basically, and sorry to whoever wrote this ebook, I'm not naming it because I don't remember what it was. But she basically said, you've got to clean out your liver. And the best way to do this is no processed foods, don't eat any junk, eat as many fruits and vegetables to clean things out as you can. So like drink a veggie juice or, you know, drink veggie, yeah, veggie juice, <laughs> basically a veggie drink and use dandelion root to clear your liver. So at first I bought dandelion root tea, but I'm like, I'm not going to, this is not that enjoyable. So I got dandelion root capsules and I was taking that and drinking a cup of dandelion root tea at night before I went to bed. Another thing that I learned was that topically grandpa's pine tar soap, which you can find at Whole Foods or on Amazon. And then I made my own little concoction because of the itching being so bad, I made this concoction of just organic coconut oil and I put a couple of drops of essential oils in it, peppermint, tea tree, because I was thinking in my mind like antimicrobial. I mixed that up and I had this routine and that they also said to take really hot showers. So I'd go take a really hot shower, use the grandpa's pine tar soap, put this lotion I made for myself <laughs> on as soon as I got out of the shower, it was very cooling. And that was the only thing that I could do to survive as I was taking these dandelion root capsules, hoping that my liver would clear this out. And it did. It took a couple of days, but I'm, I'm telling you guys, I am not a pharmaceutical person. And up to that point in my pregnancy, I had taken nothing. I had, I had ta not taken a Tylenol, hadn't taken anything, but my itching was so severe before I got to this remedy that I literally took a sleeping pill to go to sleep. I literally took Unisom to sleep because it was that bad. It was horrific. So I get on this protocol and it clears things up. And let me be clear that even for a moment, I thought, Maybe it was like some sort of mites or something that burrowed like scabies inside of under my skin, because that's what it felt like. It felt like there was an entity that was inside of my body under my skin, causing this to happen, causing this itching. I don't really know how to fully describe to you how creepy that was, but it didn't feel right. But that's not what it was. I went to the doctor and it was not scabies. It was not anything like that. So the protocol, dandelion root capsules literally saved me. And that's one of the reasons why you will hear me very often talking positively about dandelion root and using it as a way to clear the liver when there is an allergy or allergic reaction or something happening that's really taxing your liver because it helps to clear it out pretty quickly. 
So I started to finally feel better. My OB just thought I was a crazy person. When I told her this, she literally didn't care. And that was disappointing because I felt like when I came to her, I'm giving you a solution for pups, right? Like I found it. Here's what it is. Just tell people to do this. And she didn't care. So I go through the rest of my pregnancy. If you've listened to my birth story, then you'll, you, if not, go back and listen to it. I had a real fun time having an unnecessary C-section, lost a ton of blood, got this blood transfusion. Then what my whole, you know, got everything sewed back up my bladder because that was cut during my C-section. C-section area sewed back up all this stuff. So I go back to the room. My uh, birth happened in the middle of the night, 2 a.m. ish. I was done, I don't know, 5 a.m., something like that. Finally go get back to my room. It's early morning hours, maybe 9 a.m. Well, they, they give me time. They wait until evening time, afternoon, and they come with this next dose of Rogam. You know, after I've already had enough going on here. They give me the dose of Rogam. They leave. Dinner comes in. And then shortly after, I begin to have an anaphylactic reaction. And I know what this is like because I am allergic to red four. And I carry an EpiPen because of that allergy. And I happen to have my EpiPen with me, which is a good thing because they literally came in the room. And when I was like, this is not good. This is happening. My throat is closing. They're like, you have an EpiPen because it's going to take us too long to get one. <laughs> they use my own EpiPen on me. And then afterwards, they were like, we don't know. Why do you think this happened? Was it something you ate? And what I ate was literally like nothing. I think it was a hamburger. I had like two bites of a hamburger. So it wasn't what I ate. I knew it wasn't what I ate. I had eaten whatever it was and actually ate the same meal again basically every day because that's all they had to offer at this hospital. And so they kept saying, oh, it must have been something that you ate. It must have been something that you ate. I'm like, literally, I, I have eaten nothing except for this hamburger that you have given me. I mean, I don't know what this hamburger is made out of, but that would be pretty random. So it took a little while for it to click for me. It took a minute, longer than a minute. It took a little while for me to really start to connect the dots because they really were acting kind of funny about it. And I had asked something about the injection, something about Rogan. And anaphylaxis is a sound effect of Rogan. So why would they not disclose that? And why would they act like it couldn't be that it had to be what I ate when it is a literal side effect of Rogan? It's because every medical product is perfect. <laughs> they don't want to taint it, right? Well, that's when I went back to my phone records and I went into my photos and I went back to 28 weeks. When was I 28 weeks? And I looked at photos from that week. And that was the week that I got my first Rogam injection was when I started to have that develop that itching. And it just escalated from there. And after treating it, things resolved for a bit, but getting it re-injected, it was like that second time my body just could not tolerate it. And I was treated like I was crazy again, as medical gaslighting is such a big thing. And I'm just so used to it by now that it honestly doesn't even bother me. But when I went to, oh man, but when I went to the doctor, when I was pregnant the second time, one of the OBs, a male OB he literally came into the room and said, man, you have bad mojo. I see here, it's written down that you're allergic to Rogam. 
and he treated me like I was a pariah. And that was actually one of the biggest moments of me leaving and exiting that like mental exit of the medical system was the way that that OB, OB treated me regarding my allergic reaction to Rogan. But what he didn't know was during the in-between after Brooke and before my second Ben, I had been doing my research and I discovered a Facebook group called Rogam Rebellion and found that there were thousands of other women like me who had had terrible or anaphylactic and other reactions to the Rogam injection. This injection is not without its side effects, you guys. It's not without the awful things that could potentially happen. In fact, right on NIH.gov, you can find some information about the <sighs> about how using it, there is a black box warning that recommends closely monitoring patients for at least eight hours. That's right. Closely monitoring patients to see if they develop fever, back pain, shaking, chills, discolored urine, or worse. So they say that it's rare, but there can be life-threatening toxicities and even an overdose of the immune thrombocyopenic purpura. Purpura. Oh, man. It is unfortunate that I found this information out after having the experience and having to go through it, but that's just life sometimes. And that's just how things go. And now I'm here to share that experience with you and perhaps help someone else out there who is considering following the standard for Rogan to just say, do your research. Sarah, oh, Sarah Wickham, Dr. Sarah Wickham, she wrote a book called Anti-D that a lot of people use as a reference point, gives a lot of statistics and can basically reiterate some of the information I shared today. And that might be a good resource for you, but I certainly recommend joining the Rogan Rebellion Group. I'm not affiliated with it or anything like that, but it helped me a lot to read other women's stories and to really see that I wasn't alone because I trust women. I trust the stories of other women, of other moms who have gone through this more than I trust these doctors who are not educated on these products and their side effects. They're just doing things in a routine. They're doing things in a cycle. So really encourage you to do your own research, but even more than that, <sighs> pray on it and ask the Lord to guide you through and to help you make those decisions. And also consider these verses on the blood and the importance of your blood. And if you want your blood to be not your blood, <laughs> if you want the blood of others to be inserted inside of your veins, because it's certainly something that I've reflected on since and have had a very big change of heart about what I will accept into my body and what circumstances I may or may not. So it's a decision to be made. Now, if you've been listening for a while, you'll know that I have three children now and I have never received Rogam after the first. And if you're interested to know, yes, Every single one of my children has a positive blood type. So is it a risk for me to continue to move forward without getting this shot that potentially could prevent this very rare condition? Maybe, but 
getting the injection is more of a risk to me. I'm not going to inject something that I had an anaphylactic reaction to. That's crazy. <laughs> I'm, I, I refuse to do that again. But so you have to decide which is the bigger risk. Potentially having a blood mixing event or having an adverse reaction like I have it up here. Chills, headache, asthenia, fever, dizziness, infection, hypertension, drowsiness, shivering, pallor, increased hemoglobin, anaphylaxis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, on and on. Oh, and death. So that is what we're up against here. <laughs> And I know that this is a little bit of a, this might sound like this is a little bit of a negative spin and maybe it is, but I don't see it as negative so much as real. This is my real story and this is what happened to me and it's changed me much like many of the other things that have happened during my births. So I really just want to encourage you to always do your research on everything that you are putting into your body, be it from the medical system or from the food from your grocery store. You know, it's important that we take care of the temples of the Holy Spirit that the Lord has given us and that we really use discernment when it comes to these products and thinking about why, the why behind it. Why was this only studied in prisoners and men before being given to pregnant women? Now, the medical system will tell you it's because it's unethical to perform research on pregnant women. But uh, guess what? They're performing research on us by giving us this injection as they are with other injections like um, <clears throat> COVID. Receiving a completely rushed jab during pregnancy, man, I'm just going to say it. Those women are the experiment. They are the test study. So listen, y'all don't be the test study. Put your heart towards the Lord and towards his mission and towards what he wants for your life and trust that he is going to get you through and that if he doesn't, that's okay too, because that is part of his greater plan. We try so hard to save ourselves from potential issues or sickness or dying. And we're going to die anyway. We're all going to die. None of us are going to get out alive. So let's not fear the unknown. Let's not fear the what if. Let's not fear dying and death. And let's instead look to the Lord do our research, question everything, and then make decisions from there. I hope that this has been helpful. And I hope that someone out there, maybe this will also give somebody out there a remedy to actually having pups <laughs> or some other skin condition. And honestly, this treatment for dandelion root has also worked for some of the moms that I know in their children that have eczema. They have actually gotten the tincture version of dandelion root for their young children and given it to their children to help cleanse out that liver in kids with eczema. And it has helped. Rachel is one of them. Her son, it helped him tremendously. So if you are experiencing something with your skin, you may need to clean or cleanse your liver. Talk to your doctor or whatever. This isn't medical advice. It's just information but talk to your chiropractor about it because I bet you they have some experience <laughs> working with this. And yeah, that's it for today, you guys. Next week, we again are, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be moving into some awesome testimonies and I'm looking forward to it. We'll be kicking off an intro episode next week. So you're not going to want to miss that series. Stay tuned. And thank you for tuning in and for being on this journey. As always, if you'd like to follow along outside the podcast, you can do so on Instagram and Facebook at The Radiant Mission, or you can watch this in video form on YouTube. Today, I'm going to close with 1 John 1, 
and 2 verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Wishing you a radiant week and I'll see you next time. Bye everyone.